Hello and welcome to our weekly look inside Syria. I'm Hazm Seeker. Well, the Syrian opposition wrapped up its meetings in Istanbul after eight long days of intense negotiations. They postponed electing a new leader but agreed on an expansion deal. As of now, Syria's opposition also says it will not take part in proposed international peace talks in Geneva next month. The head of the Syrian National Coalition, George Sabra, announced the decision on Thursday. He says they're suspending not their participation until the international community intervenes to end the siege in Qusayr. The Syrian opposition is also demanding that any negotiation must lead to Assad's resignation. Meanwhile, in an interview with Hezbollah's Al Manar television, the Syrian president said he is very confident of victory. While on the battlefield, fighting remains as fierce as ever. The Syrian opposition says a thousand fighters have arrived to fend off government troops in Qusayr. And there are also reports that government forces supported by Hezbollah fighters have almost completely regained control of the city. The city has been under the control of rebel forces for months, but government soldiers are determined to take it back. Alan Fisher has more. In Kuzair, they say the injured are all over town. Why are we being sentenced to death, this man asks. Syrian activists say people who tried to help the injured were attacked by government forces, meaning more dead and injured. Syrian army ranks have been swollen by fighters from Hezbollah, the Shia Lebanese group. Together, they're intensifying the push against rebels in Kuzair. The Syrian opposition say the world should stop them. They are a foreign fighter. They are coming to another country. And the international community is still looking as nothing has happened. In Washington, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry appealed to Russia to rethink its shipment of an air defense system to the Syrian government, saying it was a threat to Israel uh, morning, and to everybody. the prospects uh, of holding peace talks. We ask them again not to upset the balance uh, within the region uh, with respect to Israel and uh, uh, the weaponry that is being provided to Assad, whether it's an old contract or not, it has a profoundly negative impact on the balance of interests and the stability of the region, and it does put Israel at risk. Kerry was speaking after a meeting with the German foreign minister. The European Union is to lift its arms embargo on the rebels, but Guido Westerveld said that doesn't mean shipments are planned. The weapons embargo of the European Union will end. This does not mean that we deliver or someone would like to deliver in the next days or weeks weapons to Syria. Around Damascus, the military continues to hit areas held by the opposition. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad insists his side will win. It's a world war being waged against Syria. We're confident of our victory. His government says the army is also making advances, regaining control of rebel strongholds, especially in eastern Ghouta, near the capital. For those civilians who managed to escape Kuzair, one of their few options is to go to the province of Dera. But continued fighting here makes this a deadly risk. Alan Fisher for Inside Syria, Washington. Well, joining us now to discuss this are our three guests. In London, Haytham Sabahi, a Syrian political activist, in Turkey, we have Colonel Abdel Hamid Zakaria, spokesman for the Free Syrian Army. And joining me here in the studio, we have Louis Safi, a senior member of the Syrian National Coalition. Welcome to uh, all of you. Uh, Colonel Zakaria, if I could start with you. I want to ask you, first of all, uh, about the meetings uh, in Istanbul this week and what came out of them. Are you happy with the end result? And do you feel that the Free Syrian Army is better represented now? In the name of Allah, the most gracious, most merciful. As a matter of fact, the Syrian revolution has been suffering not only from the response of the international community as much from the regime and the opposition themselves. This struggle between or among the opposition has a negative impact on the ground on the Free Senior Army fighters. 
It is true that recently the meeting, recent meetings of the coalition has so seen more representation of the Free Syrian Army with all its components. Yet I regret to say the glorious picture uh, we had hoped has changed in the minds of all the Syrians. We had hoped that the coalition would be a true diplomatic and political umbrella not only to help the Free Syrian Army achieve more victory on the ground and facilitate all possible means for assistance, but also work towards building a bright future for our citizens in Syria. The way, if I could turn to you on this then, clearly uh, a lot of dissatisfaction from the uh, spokesman for the Free Syrian Army that we just heard there. He's saying that uh, your group uh, still has a long way to go to get its act together. Well, uh, I'm not, I did not come here to enter into a duel with the, with the colonel. Uh, basically, uh, the opposition can be criticized, actually, as any other organization, particularly it's being put together under so very difficult situations. And I think uh, there's a confusion between uh, desire f to, to shape it in a certain way and its own act. Uh, the, the, the difficulty really is that every time the opposition tries to put its, its, its house in order, there is a pressure to bring in new elements that br sometimes bring us to, to the first uh, square. So, um, as I said, now at this point, I think we have made a good progress. The FSA, who, who I, I guess the, the colonel is speaking um, on its behalf, is now part of the, of the uh, coalition. And I think there would be a time for every person who participated in this to, to be called to question. But now we have one enemy. We have the regime. The regime is the one who is killing people, attacking cities, uh, uh, creating mess by, by, by uh, making uh, erroneous uh, judgment and taking the wrong positions vis-a-vis -vis the, the Syrian people. Uh, can you clarify the position of, of the SNC at the moment as far as um, what, what conditions will be attached to these talks um, in Geneva. We, we heard, uh, the latest that we heard is that they will not, under any circumstances, uh, deal with, with the Syrian government if uh, uh, Assad remains in power. Is that still the position right now? Well, the position uh, is that we are willing to enter negotiations that uh, achieve transition to democracy, and that would mean that Assad will not be there. That's our, our position. Um, there was a statement um, a couple of days ago made by the uh, president, uh, uh, interim president of the, of the coalition, uh, asking for Hezbollah to get out of Syria and the uh, international community to take an action to prevent the continuous attacks on the Syrian people by the combination forces of the regime and Hezbollah. And unless that is done, then we are not really interested in negotiation. You cannot negotiate while we have an external intervention and the world is silent about it. Hey, Tab Sabahi, uh, the Syrian regime is not interested in negotiation at this point. Your response? Well, first of all, the Syrian government has agreed to go to Geneva. They need to test the water. I mean, this is the problem we're facing, as you heard now. In, in the coalition or the FSA, there is a quite a lot of different groups. And the Syrian government, actually, and the Syrian people who, like me, who they are pro the Syrian government, we are confused. Who? Uh, these people, where their loyalty lies. I mean, some groups, their loyalty lies with Saudi Arabia or United States or Turkey. Some others with Turkey, some with Qatar. We don't know. We want an opposition where loyalty is to the Syria, uh, to Syria and Syrian people. This is this is the problem where we're facing. This type of groups, they changing alliance every day, and we don't know where we are with them. The Syrian government has. Uh, 
been speaking in one voice. And of course, we, we know it's a government at its best and can negotiate and can talk. But as the President Bashar Assad said, if we want to talk with, with what you call it, the slaves of the government, no, no, we will talk with those governments who control this, this type of alliance or, or this coalition. I mean, every time they meet to, to come out with some decisions, they end up with the problems and more division, and they call on the people in Syria to resort to arms and keep fighting. None of their families or children, the, the, this, the SNC, uh, in, in Syria, they don't care about the Syrian people. We care about who is in Syria. We want this crisis to end politically, as John Kerry himself said. We we wanted to end politically and start political process and everything will be agreed in Geneva or anywhere else will be put to the, to the referendum of the Syrian people and that's what exactly the Syrian wants because they want to see what these people present on the Syrian ground, who is their supporters, nobody knows the, the quantity of their supporters, uh, all what we see is conferences here and there and arguments and arguments and last week it was I mean um, any any one of them should be ashamed they were attacking to each other they were taking words from from the French ambassador uh, which is also worse the American ambassadors what he said to them there is videos about this if these people could stand from the French ambassador and American ambassador All right. and they they be talking to them like this I mean how would they lead right, the I country wanna, I want to I want to turn I want to turn back to Colonel uh, Zakaria uh, then because uh, I, I know you want to respond to to what you've just heard there but I also uh, want to ask you as well about the current situation in the border town of El Qusair and the reports that we're getting from there it appears that the government has the upper hand there with reports of a an ongoing siege but then we've also been getting these reports uh, of uh, more um, uh, rebel fighters moving in to the area what can you tell us about that I would like to begin say to the guest uh, Asafi who is with you in the studio that today when we speak openly and candidly it is the first step towards bu building Syria the future where we aspire that all will live equal coexist without fearing the other the regime has been oppressing the people for decades we wish to radically change the life, uh, way of life of the Syrians. When Mr. Haytham said that the Syrian regime has agreed to join the Geneva Conference, this is not true. He himself that we will put all the matters to the Syrian people. The question is, why uh, was not the Syrian people put in the picture when he was inducted as a lawful president? Within a few minutes, the Syrian constitution was amended and modified to bring him to the seat of power whereby we see all these tragic catastrophic uh, repercussion he claims that there is only one voice in Syria and to him I respond saying there is only one voice the voice of oppression the voice of uh, slaughter the voice of oppression and the voice of the president and his own imagination when he says that we don't speak to them but we speak to the parties and countries standing behind them it is a twisted fact if we sit with the representative of the regime we are simply negotiating with Russia and Iran simply for the reason that we are certain that the regime has no word or will speaking of al Qusair. There are many military details which I cannot disclose. However, I can say that our situation on the ground is good. We are aware that the regime is deploying more troops and hardware to the uh, uh, Al-Qusair area. We have our own military uh, intelligence, we have our own facts, but we cannot disclose the number of fighters or the amount of military hardware and gear. And we are deployed on the routes of supply from Hezbollah to the regime, or the routes through which the new 
waves of uh, free Syrian army fighters are coming. However, I can also say that the humanitarian condition in Al Qusair is very deteriorating. It is very catastrophic. How can the international community remain silent in the face of all these tragedies? The international community is uh, raising false excuses so as not to prevent military, so as not to provide us with military assistance. What about the humanitarian relief aids? The international community can provide humanitarian aid to the Syrian people in Al Qusair. The international community claims there are jihadi fighters or terrorist groups, whatever they name it. Uh, in Al Qusair. We raised the question here. All right. Who brought the condition that worse? And the other question to ask what the international community provided to prevent the formation of these jihadi uh, but, uh, brigades. If the international community is willing to fight terrorism, it should start by Iran and Hezbollah. Why Hezbollah has not been listed? on the list of terrorist organizations. Why Hezbollah hasn't been punished? Today, the international, the Syrian revolution will topple not only the regime, but will also topple the head of terrorism, Iran. All right. Colonel, the, we'll, we'll talk about, we'll talk more about Hezbollah and, and Iran in, in, in just a moment. But just allow me to, to interrupt, if I may, because I want to ask you uh, uh, just a more general question uh, about the situation inside Syria at the moment. Syrian President uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, it appears right now, cannot regain uh, full control uh, of the country. But on the other side, uh, your rebel forces don't appear strong enough to overthrow him. So to many people outside of Syria, it, it does seem that your country uh, is doomed to months or even years of, of civil war. Is, is that a, a realization that um, your side will, will perhaps have to come to at some point? We have no other alternative but to continue fighting, to continue our revolution till the end. The regime cannot be negotiated with. This regime understands only this, that negotiating means surrender and more murder. Uh, al -As uh, Assad can release whatever statements as he may wish. However, realities on the ground are totally different. Despite the Free Syrian Army is not getting any support, and more now we can say that more 75% of the home soil is under uh, under our control. If the international community wish to prevent a civil war in Syria, which we do not hope, as the Syrians are our fellow citizens, I repeat, if the international community is willing to prevent a civil war, they should provide arm to the Free Syrian Army through the chief command, which is a true authority on the ground, so that the revolution can end at the earliest and we can spare hundreds of lives, spare many state uh, institutions and public properties. All right, Louis Sefi, there, I want to bring up a criticism that I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've heard already. Um, the, the criticism is that, that you are, your group is still disconnected to the struggle uh, on the ground in Syria. And all of this, the perception of all of this lack of unity within your group is feeding into that. Uh, what assurances can you give that, that all of those issues have been resolved? Well, well, let us say, you know, there is more bickering within the opposition that I would like to see myself uh, and anybody else within the Syrian community. But uh, again, this is a, a, an opposition that for experiencing f for the first time the, the responsibility of organizing itself. It has made a great progress. Now, there is o there's only one decision as far as the opposition is concerned. That is the, the decision of the coalition. And the confusion of your guest from London has to do from the fact he never experienced democracy in its full-fledged meaning within the Syrian community. Uh, Syrians can disagree today within the opposition, but ultimately they vote and they have one position uh, in terms of what to do with taking away this brutal regime. 
and the for referendum. I mean, he wanted referendum uh, about about uh, the, you know the, the, the transfer of power to a popular government. Well, this referendum is currently being taken by, through the blood of the Syrians. You have five million people who have been put uh, either made ref you know, uh, refugees or displaced per persons. Five million, that's almost half of the Syrian population. Isn't this a referendum? They are willing to take the, you know, to, to, to sacrifice their lives and their properties to make sure that this dictatorship will end. So uh, are we now being, you know, uh, take, you know, is there a bit of waste of time in trying to, to, to come together in unity? Yes, but I think if you look at the trajectory of the opposition, we have, we have grown gradually to become more organized opposition, both on the level of, of, of the political organization or the political wing of the revolution and in terms of the, of the military wing. And I can tell you, in the next phase, things will develop much further. There's a resolve, there's a desire to get freedom, and the Syrians will not accept this dictatorship, particularly after the, you know, it has become, you know, uh, 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 it ha after the bloodshed that has taken place over the last two years. Hey, Tab Sabahi, I want to turn to you. I know you want to respond to what you've just heard there, but I want to ask you, ask you also about the perception uh, of uh, Syria right now uh, through much of, of, of the outside world, not just in the West, that it is an increasingly isolated uh, regime uh, and it exists without without the help of groups of, of groups like Hezbollah and and countries like Iran uh, and Russia perhaps the the regime may not even be in existence yeah of course this is uh, i mean a syrian government has its allies uh, not from now is tens of years uh, if a uh, they have uh, like a Hezbollah, which is a resistant group. They have some uh, strategic relation with Iran, uh, also strategic relation with uh, with uh, Russia. They have relation with uh, many countries like uh, China, the, the BRICS countries. And when a government want to go ahead, when they had a crisis, it will use its friends. That is a normal. Like United States, when it went to Iraq, used its friends and Britain went with it. But here, what we, I'm hearing from your guest is two different stories on the political side and the military side. Uh, from the military point of view, uh, the, the guest fr from um, the general, he keeps saying we're going to fight to the end. Well, uh, the political process we want is the essence of this process is rejecting violence. This group has to fight with us, maybe the Free Syrian Army, are they prepared to fight uh, Al-Nusra Front, who is being put on the United Nations as a terrorist group? I mean, Al-Nusra Front aiding and helping somebody like the FSA. And from a political point of view, from the politician, politician has to see what is possible, what is not possible. I mean, when, when uh, Muaz al-Khatib from the, the coalition comes out, say, I give the president of, uh, of uh, Syria 20 days to leave and take 500 people. This is, was a joke. I mean, Syrian government is there. The military is dealing with the terrorists on, on the ground is there. Uh, even if there is a political agreement, we will not, uh, neither the Syrian people or the, the, the Syrian government will tolerate uh, what you call the terrorists on the ground, like Nusra Front and other fundamentalists in Syria. They have to fight them and fight right. them to the end to kick them out and right, uh, just, le let me say something here just briefly if you can because we our time is limited yes yes uh, your guests all of them uh, Everybody from the opposition keep talking about what's happened 10 years and 20 years and 30 years back. We are the children or, or, or the men of today. We want to see a political process to get Syria out of the crisis between all the Syrians. And everybody has to know his capability and what he can do and what right. he cannot do. I want to give the last word then to uh, Colonel Zakaria just in the, in the minute or so that we've got left. How do you see this uh, playing out, given what's happened over the last uh, week in, in Istanbul um, and the uh, decision by the EU to uh, lift this uh, arms embargo, the decision by Russia as well uh, to send uh, more uh, of these weapons to the Syrian government? How do you see uh, all of this playing out, though, over the next few months?
As a matter of fact, if the EU and the international community in general are honest in their statement towards uh, arming the Free Syrian Army, this will spare hundreds and thousands of victims on both sides. Uh, Russia's attempt to provide uh, missiles to the uh, al-Assad militias is meant to prolong the crisis whereby larger numbers of victims and will fall. Uh, Israel is raising threats and so is Russia. Uh, Russia claims these are old existing contracts. They uh, mean to obscure the true picture. I clearly state that Russia is a liar state. They are war mongers. They have er earlier abandoned Saddam Hussein and Al Qaddafi. Right. They will We've no gonna, doubt abandon Al Qaddafi, uh, will not abandon it there, its interests. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time, but I want to thank uh, all three of our guests, Aytam uh, Sabahi. Colonel Abdul Hamid Zakaria and Louis Safi. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you for joining us. Remember, Al Jazeera has extensive coverage of what's going on in Syria, not just on this program, but with our news programs and online at aljazeera.com. For now, for me, Hazm Seeker, thanks for watching Inside Syria. Bye for now.